one of the cardinal rules of speech writing and speech giving is you should only give a speech that only you can give. When political speeches fall flat, it's a speech that anybody else could deliver. But why are you telling us something? Why should we listen to you? What makes this unique and tailored to you? Nobody else should be able to give that speech. Greetings, everyone. My name is Julian Masters, and welcome to another episode of Inside Influence, in which I delve into the minds of some of the world's most fascinating influencers or experts in influence to get to the bottom of what it really takes to own your voice and then amplify it to drive an industry, a conversation, a movement, or a nation. Now, today we're going to dive into that last word, nation. What does it take to write a speech that is so captivating, so compelling that it has the ability to stop an entire nation in its tracks or make the planet literally sit up and pay attention or define an entire moment in history for generations to come? Would it be fair to say that the writing of that speech would take a level of mastery that's worth knowing? Now, I've worked with speakers and presenters for 20 years, and this bit, the bit we're going to talk about today the crafting of the story itself. What's too much? What's not enough? What's too simple? What's too complex? What does justice to the ideas and, and what will just get lost amongst the noise? That's always the most underestimated part. Presentation skills you can learn. It's a science, you can learn it. But an instinct for the unparalleled power of words? That is a level of mastery that's... <laughs> It's almost sensei-like, and it takes years or decades to develop. Unless, of course, you happen to have an opportunity to learn from the very best. And my guest today is exactly that. Someone I have admired for years as the master of the craft. Cody Keenan is a professional speechwriter who, as director of speech writing for President Obama, has written or edited more than 2,000 speeches for his boss including the historical March 2015 speech when Obama spoke in Selma, Alabama, marking 50 years since Bloody Sunday. More recently, he also worked on Obama's Democratic National Convention speech, which is still being described by many pundits and the media as historically unprecedented. So what does that take? Where do you start? What words do you use when there are no words? Or in moments when every single word counts so much that each will be dissected a million times by the media? What you're about to hear is basically a masterclass in compelling communication. And as part of that masterclass, we dive deep into one of the most powerful questions I have ever heard when it comes to owning your space in a room or an arena and it is this. Why are you the only one who can tell this story? Just when you listen, write that down. Please write that down. The importance of starting and ending a speech on purpose. How to grab the audience's attention from the first word and send them home with a fire to move forward. Transitions and signposting. Sounds like geeky presenter language. It is. However, it is massively important when it comes to developing a compelling presentation. Basically, all that means is how do you move seamlessly from one point to the next without losing your audience? Why the best speeches are like jazz. And this is a piece of advice that actually came from President Obama himself, where the pauses and the low notes are actually what allow the high notes to shine. Why you shouldn't put anything in a speech that you wouldn't say to a friend in a bar. Try thinking about public policy this way and you'll get what a mind flip that requires. And surprisingly and reassuringly, that even for the man who writes to a nation on some of the most pressing issues of our time, self-doubt and imposter syndrome are just par for the course. The question is, can you put them to work for you or will you let them run the show? As a heads up, Cody does make a few references to mass shooting events in the, in the context of those moments where it's really hard to find the words. I'll leave it to you to decide how best to take care of yourself and your loved ones in those moments. What I do want you to reflect on here is that, as always, genius leaves footprints. Think of the last speech you witnessed that left you glued to your chair, that left you utterly committed to taking some kind of action. Can you map out its structure? 
What caught your attention straight out of the gate? What were the core three to five points? How did they finish in such a way that it made sure that you took some action? Pay attention because all the clues I promise you are there. Oh, and finally, for the danger of repeating myself, if you write anything on a post-it note after listening to this episode and stick it to your desk, let it be this. What's the story I want to tell and why am I the only person who can tell it? In the meantime, settle back, sit up, make a cup of tea, whatever it takes, get focused and enjoy my conversation with the incredible mind that is Cody Keenan. Welcome to the podcast, Cody Keenan. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. It's such an honor, such an honor to have you here. I was just saying, I'm a massive, massive fan of your work over the years. I found myself asking at numerous different points, like who writes President Obama's speeches? Because they're just so incredible. And then I did my research, I stalked you, and you were good enough to agree to come on today. So thank you. I want to I want to kick off with how it began. Let's, let's kick off with a good with a good origin story. I heard that you you moved to Washington. I'll start it for you. Moved to Washington with no connections during a period of time when there were sniper attacks, and you ended up in a windowless mailroom. Just just walk me through those moments, those first moments in Washington. Yeah, I, I told that story to, I teach now at, at my alma mater at Northwestern University. I told that story to my students this year to kind of buck their spirits in a tough time to graduate and enter the job market. But, you know, when I was in their shoes in the same building where I teach now, um, you know, I graduated with a political science degree and uh, moved to Washington to try to find a job. And I didn't know anybody there. Uh, I mean, that's not true. I had one friend from college who, but he was a teacher doing Teach for America in a public school. So he wasn't any help in terms of finding a job. Um, and you know, the week I moved there, yeah, the city was under attack from a sniper. It sounds insane, but you can Google it, who just kind of driving around the region, just picking people off and everybody was terrified. And, you know, it was a, it was a recession, but, a, you know, a slight one. But, you know, my point in telling the students that story was, you know, things eventually work out. Uh, not quite as rough as times weren't quite as rough as they are now, but they work out. But I, my kind of big challenge then um, was what a wake up call it was to try to get into politics and move to Washington. You know, I, I figured I went to a good university. I'd seen every episode of The West Wing. How difficult could it be to find a job? Um, it turns out it was really difficult. And, and nobody cares if you have, you know, a, a degree from a fancy school, especially a degree in, you know, basically political theory, because what they want is to know what you can do. And I couldn't do very much. Um, you know, I could probably talk their ears off about the Central American political economy or something, but that's not really helpful. So, you know, I, my, my first internship uh, in Senator Ted Kennedy's office, and it, it took me months to get that, was, uh, you know, walking dogs and running memos around Congress and getting people sandwiches. But it was also an opportunity to learn if you're paying attention and, you know, figure out how Congress really works and figure out how power really works um, and gradually pick up some new skills. And that's the reason I, after I left the White House uh, a few years ago, I wanted to go back and teach in Northwestern because I wanted to teach a class that actually taught students to do something. So I teach speech writing now to about 20 students a year and and uh, slowly but surely I'm, I'm churning them out into, uh, into offices across state and local and federal governments to be kind of the next generation of young speech writers. You know, you mentioned there that you now teach speech writing and you're equipping the speech writers of the next generation, which in itself would be an incredible task, I think. What's what's class number one? So I, I come onto your speech writing course. What's the first thing you hit me with? It's actually what is a speech? Um, we examine why we do this. What are the different kinds of speeches? Um, what purpose does it serve? And we'll go through the nuts and bolts of it quickly, um, you know, that we'll expand upon over the course of the semester. But, you know, one of the most important uh, rules, my rules, and I'm sure it's the same, you know, with a lot of people you talk with, is that a, a captive audience is a terrible thing to waste. You know, if you have an audience in front of you and you don't ask them for something, 
uh, what an incredible missed opportunity that is, whether you're asking them to change their minds or, you know, uh, vote for you or buy your product, whatever it is, you know, you've, you've got an audience there and it's an incredible thing. And, and there are so many different ways you should try to reach them. But, but one of them is to ask them for something. Um, and as a, as a practical course, we don't really get into the theory of speech writing beyond that or examine historical speeches. I'll throw a couple onto each week's lecture, um, just to illustrate the techniques I'm trying to teach the students, but it's, it's really a class so that they can, you know, hit the ground running upon graduation and, and, you know, go in for that job interview with something I couldn't, which is a portfolio of work and, you know, a skill that gets them hired. And so, you know, that's lesson number one, which I think is really important to highlight that the idea of a speech, the idea of a presentation, the idea of having captive attention is to try and move somebody through a journey, a process or a story to, to some kind of an outcome. It's not just the, the blanket provision of information. That's absolutely right. And, you know, there's there's a, another reason I teach the class is there's a lot of bad speech writing out there and there's a lot of bad speech making out there. Um, you know, so often it's it's viewed as just a tool, certainly now, just to generate attention and clicks and eyeballs and headlines. But while that might be effective in the moment, um, it doesn't help you build, you know, a body of work or a reputation or, you know, change people's minds in the long run. I mean, you know, one of the things that we're pretty proud of with President Obama is that we've had remarkable message consistency over the past 16 years since he entered the public eye. Uh, there's a narrative thread that runs through all of his big speeches from the one that made him famous in 2004 to the one he gave at the Democratic Convention last week. And if you look at all that, you know, you could put together a pretty good theory um, just based on what he said over the years. And those those first, I don't know, couple of years when you were when you were first working with President Obama, was that very conscious? Did you sit down together and go, okay, what what will the threads be? Because I think that that's a process that often gets missed, right? When somebody's sitting down and going, what are my narrative threads here? What are the pillars of what I'm going to come back to over and over and over again? It is. And there's a lot to unpack here. So picking up off my story, um, I, I worked in, in Congress in the United States Senate for four years. And and I, I'm, I'm getting to the answer, I promise. Um, but I'd never considered being a speechwriter. And it was, you know, in my third or fourth year on the job where my boss poked his head around the corner and said, hey, can you write a speech? And it was purely because he was overworked and didn't have the time for it. So I lied and said yes and stayed up all Isn't night long, kind of panicking my way through it. The way that all good careers start, right? I lied, said yes, and figured Abs it out. Yes. I, I tell my, not to keep harping on my students, but I tell them this too, you know, say yes. Um, you never know where it's going to lead you. And, you know, just that single lie, that one word yes, set me off on this entire course and changed my life. And, you know, the first speech was pretty lousy, but the first time you watch somebody, and in this case it was Senator Kennedy, uh, speak your words out loud or the words you prepared for them, uh, it's pretty extraordinary. There's kind of electricity that goes through you and you just want to keep doing it. So skipping forward, I ended up on the Obama campaign uh, in 2007 as a speechwriting intern. Um, you know, when I joined, uh, there were two speechwriters, John Favreau and Adam Frankel, and we picked up Ben Rhodes over the summer. And that was our small team. Um, and I, I barely had any idea what I was doing. I was learning a lot on the job from those guys. And um, you know, studying as much as I could, you know, late at night and on weekends when we weren't in the office, which is almost never on a campaign. And a lot of it at first was mimicry. Um, I never met President Obama on the campaign. And that's because, you know, he was off campaigning, traveling the country as you should be. I think he came by headquarters maybe three times and kind of addressed the staff all at once. John had already worked with him for a few years in the Senate in pretty tight quarters. So they got to know each other really well. And, and I'll, I'll come back to this, but that's the most important part of, of a you know, speech writing relationship is understanding each other. I first met President Obama on our second day in the White House in the Oval Office, which was terrifying because it's you know, your first time in the Oval Office, your first time meeting him. I mean, it's a miracle I made it through without passing out. Um, and even for the first couple of years, I was still a junior speech writer. And it wasn't until... You know, I wrote a couple of speeches that really proved myself um, 
that I got promoted to deputy director under John and started interacting with the president more often. And then once I became chief speech writer, then I was really meeting with him, you know, almost every day and really getting to understand what he wanted to say. Um, and more importantly, why he wanted to say it. And that's something I tell, you know, any young aspiring speech writer, any new speech writer in a job is you need to demand FaceTime, um, with the person for whom you're writing. And that's not for your benefit. That's actually for the speaker's benefit, you know? And, and I understand that you know, there are CEOs who would say, I want to spend time with my speechwriter, or, you know, you tell a communications director or, or VP of communications or whatever to handle it. But it's really for the speaker's benefit. If you get to spend time with your speechwriter, if you actually, you know, make the time for it and develop a rapport with that person, you know, they'll understand you better and your worldview and what makes you tick. They'll pick up stories from you. You know, they'll be able to conjure out um, anecdotes and, and values and things you're passionate about. And it, it's not just something so that your speechwriter can say, I got to spend time with the boss today. It's so that when you get a draft, it's going to be what you want. It's going to reflect uh, kind of your thinking better. And the worst relationships are, are ones that are uh, kind of layered with a communications director or chief of staff who get in the way and filter the conversation. And, and then resentment can kind of build between the speaker and the speechwriter. And it's just, it's never great. So I don't care how powerful you are. Um, you know, President Obama made time for his speechwriters almost every day and, you know, was meticulous with his edits and walked us through his edits. And it's not just because it made us better speechwriters, it's because it made the final product better, too. Is there a process that you that you use now or that you recommend? Because not everybody has a speechwriter. Some people some people do. Some people are just in the trenches trying to do it themselves. To figure out, you, you know, you said, what do you want to say? And more importantly, why do you want to say it? Is there a process of getting those pillars in place, right? These are my, these are my core messages and these are why they're important. How do we pull that out? Yeah, <clears throat> it's going to be different for everybody. Um, the first thing I'd say is if, if you need speech writing help, I've got a bunch of great students looking for jobs. Um, but if you're, <laughs> if you're going to do it yourself, um, you know, I spend some real time alone and it sounds a little cheesy, but spend some time alone kind of writing out, you know, who are you? What makes you tick? What do you care about? You know, what's your story? Um, and be honest about it and be honest with yourself. I mean, this, this might sound kind of a little cringy self-helpy. Um, but I think it's important, you know, you should know, and it's true if you have a speechwriter too, but understand what makes you tick what matters to you. And, you know, then if you're, if you're building up towards, if you have something to say, figure out, you know, who your audience is going to be and what you actually want them to know, you know, not just that it's not what you think somebody wants to hear. I mean, that's when you usually see a speech that falls flat, but, but what makes you interesting? What makes you have something unique to say? And, and that brings me to, you know, one of the other cardinal rules of, of speech writing and speech giving is, you should only give a speech that only you can give. You know, if there are, when, when political speeches fall flat, it's a speech that anybody else could deliver. But why is it, why, why are you telling us something? Why should we listen to you? What makes, what makes this unique and tailored to you? And that could be working in your biography, your values, or what you're working on. Um, but whatever your, whatever speech you're delivering, nobody else should be able to give that speech. I'm so glad you mentioned that. I I read, I think it was a quote from you recently, um, having written the Democratic National Convention speech for, for President Obama. And you said you always start by sitting down with him and talking about, firstly, what's the story we want to tell? And why is he the only person that can tell it? And I just think that that's such a beautiful frame. Why are you the only, why are you the only person who can tell this story? Talk to me about how you approach that particular speech, because obviously that was pretty unprecedented. Yeah. I mean, I, obviously I, I meant it because, you know, if he and I, he and I are still starting with that conversation after I've been with him now for 13 years and everyone in the world knows who he is, but we still start out by saying, what's the thing that only I can say here. I should also issue the disclaimer first that he has always been our chief speech writer. Uh, I, I think anybody who's followed, you know, him or Pete Souza, his photographer on social media has seen, uh, you know, his edits on the page and, and sometimes he'll pull out the legal pad and write it himself. I mean, he's, he is a writer. He always has been, I think he's always resented having speech writers even today. Um, 
and he never misses an opportunity to remind me that he wrote the 2004 speech himself. All that said, you do develop a good rapport and trust over the years. And, and so, you know, our process for this one was different, obviously, because of COVID. Um, I haven't seen him in six months, which is, you know, by far the longest. I haven't seen him since the first campaign. And, you know, we'll talk on the phone or, or do it over email. But uh, I think we got on the phone maybe about a week before the speech and started talking it through. And our process is different, sure. But obviously, the convention was, too. Um, and I was... I didn't have anything to do with convention beyond his speech, but I was pretty nervous uh, about, you know, if the if the party would be able to pull off a convention like this. And <clears throat> I was stunned uh, at the job they did. I thought it was tremendous. But, you know, you think as a speechwriter, you're thinking through the mechanics of the speech. Right. And, you know, one of the first things you think about is the audience. Well, there's not going to be one not live anyway. Um, it turned out there were 40 million people at home watching it either on television or streaming platforms. But there's no one in front of him. So the first thing you do is dispense with applause lines and uh, jokes. You know, typically at a, at a political convention, you're going to be throwing out all sorts of red meat to the crowd. Um, but there isn't one, you know, so no one's going to cheer. No one's going to laugh. If they do it at home, nobody can hear it. So get rid of all that. I, I did. There were a couple speeches I noticed last week where, you know, uh, speech, speech writers tried too hard to keep some jokes and applause lines in there and they just kind of fell flat and I, I found myself cringing on the couch. We said, you know, this is just going to be obviously conversational, but let's make it a little intimate. I mean, how often do I get to speak to somebody one-on-one -on -one in their living room like this? Um, and the subject matter is obviously very urgent, so let's give it a little bit of urgency too. So we wrote the speech, and, and when I say we, I mean we, uh, we wrote the speech with that in mind. And I, you know, I, I did see in some of the reviews afterwards, people, a lot of people were stunned and used that word stunned by, um, you know, the, they used a variety of words, the intensity, the urgency, despair. Um, people used the word unsettled by the speech. And if, if people were unsettled by it, good. That was the point. You know, it's, people should be inspired to get up and go figure out what they can do to uh, help Democrats win this election because democracy itself is at stake. And that's really what we wanted to come through in the speech. Is there, the, the questions that's kind of coming up for me right now is, is there a line there? You know, I think for a lot of people, you go into those words like unsettling, stunned, you have to bring a lot of yourself to a speech in order to get that kind of a response. Is there a line there that you walk with President Obama where you think, no, that's just, that's a little bit too much. You know, I think that that's gone past the realms of, of appropriate and into, you know, almost too emotive. Is there a line that you walk? No, that's a really good question. I, I think there's no such thing as too emotive. Um, and that's, you know, kind of if there is a, a hallmark of my speech writing, that's what I go for is trying to make people feel something. You know, you can you can bludgeon an audience over the head with facts and figures and the ins and outs of policy. And, you know, President Obama likes to do that when we're delivering a big policy speech. Um, I prefer to go right at somebody's gut because I, I, I find that to be a way that a speech is more memorable. You know, nobody's going to remember a whole bunch of numbers, facts and figures. If you can shock them with one, sure. But they're going to remember how it made them feel and if it translates into their own life. So. I'm all for emotion. Um, it's pretty rare he's asked me to walk anything back. You know, the first example that that comes to mind is um, that it was back in 20, December 2012, the day that uh, there was a mass shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, uh, and uh, 20 six-year-old children were murdered in their classroom. And um, in the first statement he had to give on it to the press that day, you know, I'd added in a paragraph about you know, as, as a parent, the first thing he thought of was his own girls and, um, and continued on from there. And he just, he cut that paragraph out and said, that's too raw. I'm not going to be able to get through that without crying. And then he ended up crying anyway, um, and had to pause for a while. And, you know, that really, that ends up driving home a point too. I mean, people like seeing emotion, but you can, you can also do too much of it. I mean, the fact that president Obama doesn't show emotion very often, um, uh, means that the times when he does carry an even tougher punch. And, you know, I was watching the speech at home last week, like everybody else. 
in his delivery was was extraordinary. The fact that he rose to a moment like that uh, and actually choked up towards the end um, made it much much more powerful. And that's you know people will ask, do you do you give him stage directions to do that? Like do you write sing here, pause here, cry here? No, you can't manufacture stuff like that. You know, you're either feeling it or you're not. Uh, so I, I think it gave the speech a much more powerful impact. You know, it's really interesting that you say that. One of the things, um, you know, I don't teach speech, write, speech writing, but I'm often called upon to to teach presentation skills for different corporations and, and also students. And one of the things that I talk about is your power is in the contrast. You know, if you are normally stoic and you know and not very, very emotive with your voice then the moment of impact is when you shift up a gear if you're normally really high energy then your moment of impact is when you slow down and bring some gravity into your voice like it doesn't there isn't one formula for impact but it's usually when you shift out of your usual gear into something else that it breaks the state so, you know, the fact that he is normally quite serious and has such gravitas about him when he does go into his emotions on something, that is a really powerful moment. Absolutely. In a lot of ways, you're conducting your audience, too, as a public speaker. You know, your body language, your tone, the volume of your voice, all of these things are telling them when to listen, when to applaud, when to laugh. Um, you're signaling where you are in the speech. You know, it's all these different cues that your audience picks up on. And you're exactly right. Changing them up has a big impact. Let's dive into the mechanics. The mechanics of a compelling speech and the elements that need to be there. Talk to me about the, the opening moments. When you sit down to write a speech, what, what, do you, what do you feel needs to be in those opening moments? What do you plan for? Well, if we're if we're being honest here, you know the the opening and the closing are the two best parts of the speech. Oh, that's yeah, when you can that's use, totally true. For sure, that's when you can use emotion, humor, stories. The middle is usually pretty boring. Um, certainly in in political speeches and policy speeches, like you know the State of the Union address, that's where you get all the business done. And he and I have joked over the years, you know, well the opening and the closing are great. The middle kind of sucks, but that's par for the course. Um, but an introduction, you know, you have one chance to grab the audience's attention. If you don't right off the bat, they're not going to suddenly start paying attention five or ten minutes in. So grab their attention, um, you know, whether it's with an anecdote or a joke or saying something unexpected. Um, you don't have to go overboard, but but just have something there where they that's where the audience says, OK, this is worth listening to. Um, I think the worst part of any opening and we were guilty of this in the white house because well he liked doing it but it's the acknowledgments um you know some for some reason there's this tendency to you know you have to acknowledge everybody in the room the people who invited you the vips who were there and sometimes it can just go on and on and we'd have our you know the political department of the white house or the policy teams would say well you have to acknowledge this person and i'd always push back and say why you know, did, did they do something extraordinary for this? Are we just shouting them out just because they drove 10 blocks from the Capitol to the White House? I mean, the shorter, the better. And and once um, but he like he did like doing it because he was like, look, it's, you know, in the president of the United States, if it, it's, sometimes you can make somebody's year by doing this. But there was one speech once that I, I really thought was important. And I wanted you know to make sure and the cable networks going to take it live. And I wanted to make sure that it aired and his acknowledgments went on so long that CNN cut away before he even started speaking. And oh, I just, sent I can just enraged... imagine your heart dropping in that moment. I sent an enraged email to staff saying we're never doing acknowledgments again. Um, but uh, so don't get, you know, you can have a, 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 a grace note thanking your host, but you don't need to go overboard thanking every single person who's there. So let's go back to that the opening part again. What's your What's your favorite way to open? Or what's your favorite opening you've ever wrote without putting you on the spot? Uh, oh, that is putting me on the spot. It's totally have, putting you I on have, the spot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple, actually. Um, you know, again, with the caveat that President Obama works on all his speeches. The, I love just diving in as, as a form of grabbing attention. So my two favorites were um, the speech he gave at the 70th anniversary of D-Day in Normandy. And the speech he gave in Selma, Alabama on the 50th anniversary of the March, uh, 
the march from Selma to Montgomery. And um, both of those, the subject matter and the place, you know, kind of write the speech themselves. You can't, it's hard to screw up a speech about D-Day when you're standing, you know, a couple hundred yards from the cliffs at Normandy. Uh, it's hard to screw up a speech about, you know, Selma, where a bunch of black Americans were brutally beaten for just marching for the right to vote. So I thought it'd be cool rather than just to retell the story and certainly not to start out with acknowledgements by just diving right in um, and telling the story of the hours before the event that we all know. So for, I don't have it right in front of me, but for, you know, D-Day, I actually started the speech the day before. Um, and the opening line of the speech, well, you know, I, I thought about, I did a lot of reading for both these speeches too, which if you have the luxury of time, reading reading up and doing a bunch of research makes any speech better. But, I, you know, I read a lot about the day before D-Day and all the planning that went into it. And, you know, what it was like the day before for, you know, generals who were terrified it might not work and for soldiers who thought, you know, this might be it. Um, and started the speech with, you know, if prayer were made of sound, the skies over England that night would have deafened the world. And went into the planning and the preparation and captains pacing decks and, uh, young soldiers, you know, kissing a picture of their wife and tucking it in their shirt. And, and then kind of in the third paragraph, just ending that section with, uh, the armada kind of setting off across the channel. And then I allowed for some acknowledgements cause I knew, you know, he'd want to acknowledge president Sarkozy and, and veterans there and whatnot, but that's a powerful way to do it too. You know, just starting out with the story behind the story, uh, before you get to any acknowledgements or the purpose of the speech. I did the same thing with Selma and, and rather than just begin with um, the confrontation on the bridge between the marchers and the police, I started with what it was like in the church basement a couple hours before where, you know, people knew what they were getting into. They knew there was a chance um, that this would end violently. What do they do to prepare? Well, it turns out, you know, there was a priest in there praying with people and there were people who taught the tactics of nonviolence who were literally teaching people what to do if you get hit with tear gas. Um, just kind of this nervous energy in the air, you know, people pacing around and, and preparing themselves for what lay ahead that, you know, if there's anything in common between those two speeches, that was it. Uh, and again, I tried to do three or four paragraphs worth before getting to the acknowledgements. And um, I've always thought it's cool to tell the story about what happened before the story we all know. I'm just you know, having a, a geek out moment here where just that first line that you said, you know, the skies above London, where does that come from? Does it, does it arrive? Do you f have fragments of it? This is just me as a writer geeking now. Does it arrive in one piece? Does it come over days? Sometimes. Um, it's all, it's all different. You know, I, I think with that one, I just thought about the night before, you know, one side of the channel knows what's about to happen. The other doesn't. And I, I just imagined that nobody was sleeping. You know, this came from just days of, of reading about it. And, you know, just picturing that everybody was lying wide awake, wide awake, praying. For some other lines, I used a similar construction. Well, the same construction um, in a eulogy I had to give after another mass shooting in Tucson. You know, our researcher found uh, one of the victims. This was a shooting where... Uh, a congresswoman, Gabby Giffords, was shot in the head while she was um, holding a uh, town meeting with supporters outside of a grocery store. It was just one of those things where it was Saturday morning, people are going to shop for groceries, and, you know, you can stop by and ask your congresswoman a question. It was just kind of, you know, democracy in its purest form. And uh, um, a guy went and shot a bunch of people up, and one of the victims was a, a nine-year-old girl. And one of our researchers, I still know how he did it, he found this book about children who were born on 9-11, one from each state, as kind of this, you know, hopeful, hopeful book. And it turns out the the little girl was born on 9-11. Um, and then she was taken from us in an act of violence. And on each side of, um, there were 50 kids in the book, and on each side of their photos, there were, you know, wishes for the, the child's life, you know, and the ones next to her were, I hope you... Uh, help people in need. I hope you know the words to the national anthem and sing it with your hand over your heart. And I hope you jump in rain puddles. And you, know, you just think about what what a what, a, what an image that is of a kid jumping in a in a puddle. You know how carefree it is. And after this community was just you know 
just devastated by by something the fact that something like that could happen you know in their community and a little girl could could be taken from us in, in such a way giving them back that image of a little girl jumping in rain puddles you know seemed to me like an important thing for the president to do after he after he called on all of us to to be better um so it, it was actually in the i mean this you know, this is a little personal, but it was it was actually in the shower on the morning of the speech where I was it came to me as, you know, if there are rain puddles in heaven, Christina's jumping in them today. So that's a long answer to your question, but I've always found that inspiration can come from anywhere, uh, at any time. And for me, if if I'm working on a complicated speech, it's usually in the front of my mind at all times, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing, I'm constantly working it out in my head, which as my wife has, has rightly pointed out, it makes me a terrible conversationalist. Uh, if I'm if I'm stressing about a speech, if we're you know out to dinner with a bunch of people, I'll just be sitting there staring while working through the speech in my head. But um, you know, I find that the notes app on my iPhone is very helpful. I'll just kind of jot down notes and ideas whenever they pop into my head like that. Or or you know, in the White House, I just email them to myself. I'm I'm so glad I'm not the only one who does that. I was actually just saying to my <laughs> husband the other day, I was like, I think that three quarters of my emails in my inbox are from me to me with just yeah, ideas, yeah. thoughts, a snippet of a conversation that someone's just had with me, a question that someone just asked. I, I email me more than any other person on the planet. It doesn't totally. say much. And if anybody else saw it, they'd think we were, they'd think we were crazy people. You know, Completely. I would say, write this first, then go to this. Here's the transition. <laughs> it makes no sense. Actually, I wasn't going to go here, but you just said what I think is an important word, transition. I think oh. one of the biggest things that people struggle with when it comes to a compelling presentation, a compelling speech, is the segues, the transitions, how to move from one point to another, from the intro to your first point, from your first point to your second, third point, and then just the classic structure, third point into a close. How do you how do you manage those transitions? How do you write for transition? It's it's so important. I mean, and this is something that the president taught me early on is that the most important thing in any speech is its structure. You know, if, if, if he ever tore up a speech, which was very rare, um, it would be because the structure wasn't right and it doesn't hold together, you know, and he'd walk us through the structure and, and say, try again. But you know, you, it, the speech has to tell a story from beginning to end. It has to have a logical linear structure to it. It has to make sense. You know, the it, words matter, you know, every, word should flow into the next every sentence should flow into the next every paragraph should flow into the next and transitions are a critical part of that not just to make sure that the written word flows well but you also have a live audience in front of you that is listening to your speech not reading it so as a speechwriter you're writing for the ear and transitions make a speech much much easier to follow uh and there are lots of ways to do it um you know you can you can literally do it as simply as I have three points. First, blah, blah, blah. Second, blah, blah, blah. Third, blah, blah, blah. That the end. You know, and that's the essay structure we learn as as seventh graders. Um, you can obviously go much more complicated and, and use rhetorical, what I call signposts. Uh, that's, you know, here's my first point, blah, blah, blah. And then you can summarize it. Uh, so that was my first point. My second point is this. Um, signpost by saying, so, so far we've talked about X idea. Now I'd like to talk about Y idea. So far we've talked about X and Y. Now I'd like to talk about Z. Uh, if you notice your audience flagging a little bit, you can just say, now this is important and you'll get some ears perking up, but signposts should serve to move a speech along too. Um, so that your audience knows where they are and what they've heard so far. You know, there was, there was one speech at the Republican convention I was listening to the other night that uh, had no transitions whatsoever. It just bounced jarringly from idea to idea. And, you know, the sentences that went next to each other made no sense. It would talk about one issue and then instantly be talking about another uh, without any idea or theme that joins them. Um, and it just makes it much harder for anyone. If you ask someone what that speech was about, it makes it really hard for somebody to sum it up. You can say, well, it was about a bunch of different things. But a speech should be about one thing, really. Uh, and you can tie all sorts of different ideas together under one banner. But if you're going to have a lot of different um, ideas and points to make, they, they need to flow together well. And I can't, just for anyone that's listening, I can't underline 
exactly what you just said enough that you know if you would look at the most important elements of a speech you've got the opening which is kind of the big idea then the segues between the points and then the close like what the points themselves sometimes they they just need to be said sometimes they're not that compelling sometimes it's just technical information that needs to be put across but the intro the segues and the close those are the things that i you know i believe need the most attention when you when you're putting a compelling speech together um let's just talk about language human language and and storytelling i have this big bee in my bonnet about the use of human language or what i would call charismatic language so language that actually means something that that evokes something and i found this quote from you and it said i won't put anything in a speech that i wouldn't say to a friend in a bar why is that so important yeah. the, well there i'm talking about policy and and jargon and the curse of knowledge um so many politicians at least, and I, I think probably corporate leaders too, will give speeches in their issue area without realizing that their audience has no idea what they're talking about. And that doesn't mean you have to dumb down a speech. You should never dumb down a speech. You know, we always try to treat voters and the American people as smarter than us. Um, but you do need to, you know, just talk with them colloquially and conversationally. And you don't need to bludgeon your audience over the head with, how much you know about a certain topic, you know, especially if they don't know anything about it. So in the White House, if, if you know, if the president wanted to give a complicated a speech on a complicated policy area like, you know, the housing market or um, I don't know, what have you, you know, our, our policy team, God bless them, would come with, you know, well, they'd say, well, here's our plan here. It's got 20 points. Um, and, you know, he needs to say the phrase, you uh, innovative financing mechanism or whatever. And I'd say, you know, he doesn't need to hit all 20 of these points. He doesn't need to use that phrase. Or what happens if he doesn't? And they never had a good answer. But it's what he wants, what you need to do is get your audience to remember what you said and hopefully go act on it or go tell their friends about it. You know, you can't do that if you're just beating them over the head with jargon and, um, unnecessary facts and figures. I mean, that's, I would always, I would always tell people, put it on the fact sheet, you know, and we can give a fact sheet to reporters who cover the speech. But for, for an audience, you just need to tell them why this matters to them and connect on a visceral level. Um, and you can, if you have to, you can always say, you know, go to my website to find out more information. Um, but jargon is just bad. It, 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 cliche is bad. Too much policy is bad. You know, any, a speech doesn't have to, you don't suddenly violate the rules of good speech making just because you want to talk about something that's complicated. You know, you want to make it simple. You want to keep it conversational. You want the audience to remember what you said and hopefully remember what you said the next day. You know, uh, if, if, if you see heads stop nodding while you're talking, if they're just kind of staring blankly or worse, looking at their phones, then uh, you need to, you know, Maybe you should use some sharp conversational speak to bring them back into it. It takes courage, right? Sometimes to to step yeah. outside of the jargon to step because you've, as you said, you've got the policymakers handing you this big document. Those are you know quote unquote the right words, the right words that nobody can argue with, and it takes courage sometimes to translate those words and to use human language because as soon as you use human language, you open the door to be pulled apart. Whether that was the right interpretation, the wrong interpretation. Yeah. And, and, and to get back to your question about your actual question about uh, a friend in a pub, my, my point with that is if you're going to sit down with your buddy at the end of the day and you're each having a pint and, you know, he or she asks you, what'd you do today? You're not going to say, well, um, I unveiled a new innovative microfinancing mechanism to leverage private sector capital to blah, 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 blah. You're going to say, uh, I helped more kids afford college. That makes sense. That's what you want to tell your audience. Have you ever had have you ever had a time where you just thought it wasn't going to come together, where it's either the night before oh my God, or all the time. minutes before? <laughs> tell me tell me about one of those times. I had one last week, um, <laughs> when you're not sure if, if the speech works, if the draft works, um, you're not sure if it meets the moment, you're not sure if it's enough, um, and that can be really stressful. I mean, to be a speechwriter in a lot of ways is to be plagued with self-doubt and it never goes away. And 
you know, even after eight years in the White House and, you know, two years on the campaign and almost four years with him since, I am still plagued with self-doubt all the time. I mean, I've written thousands of speeches. Um, and, I, you know, I still have imposter syndrome. I think most good people do. Um, if, if, you're, if you're truly good at your job and care about what you do, I think you should feel some sense that, you know, you need to earn it all the time. Um, you know, not to get wanna... hyper-partisan. Sorry, I, I want to underline what you just said there, that most people do get imposter syndrome. I don't think that's a well-known fact, that if you're, if you're good at what you do, you feel the need to prove yourself every day, that most people who are great at what they do feel an element of self-doubt all the time. I, I feel it with every significant speech. You know, with every speech that I know is important, uh, I will have that terror. And, you know, not to get hyperpartisan, but I think one of the problems with the current administration in the United States is that nobody there has that feeling of imposter syndrome. I, I do think they all feel like they've earned it and deserved it. And that's why they treat it the way they do. And, but I think with any enterprise you're in, you know, whether it's government, political, corporate, I think you're going to want a bunch of people at the top who feel like they need to earn it every day. Um, or, and, and I think it just, it keeps you sharp. It keeps you hungry. It keeps you humble. Uh, and it keeps you creative too. You know, once you do start feeling like you're out of ideas or once you start feeling comfortable, it might actually be time for you to go, uh, and hand it over to somebody else. And there were certainly times I felt that way in the white house, but then the, uh, the self doubt would just come screaming back and I'd realize I wasn't quite done yet. But what I usually do in those circumstances is it's, it's in those circumstances, it's so important to have good people around you. Um, you know, people often ask, what do you do if you have writer's block or if you're panicking about a speech or whatever? I mean, nowadays, since we're all trapped in our apartments, I just talk to my wife um, and she's the one that helps me through. You know, I'll, I'll sketch out a speech with her verbally. And if I do, you know, have a moment of panic, she'll be the one that says, hey, you can do this. I believe in you. And sometimes that's all you need to hear, no matter what level you're at. Um, in the white house, I would go around the corner to my deputy's office and, and say, you know, I'm struggling with this. Can I talk it out with you first? And I would just kind of talk out the speech as quickly and colloquially as I could. Sometimes it would just come to me as I was doing that in a way that it wouldn't when I was sitting in front of a blank screen. Um, and we could solve it without him having to say a word. Other times, you know, we actually had to talk it out and he'd say, well, what about this? What about that? And um, lean on other people. You know, I was lucky in the White House that there was a team of eight of us who wrote for the president and the first lady. So I had a, I had a bunch of talented, brilliant speechwriters that, that, you know, I edited all day long, but who edited me in return and would suggest different ways of looking at things and doing things. There's an element there where, as you said, that nerves are appropriate, where it's just giving due gravity to the importance of the work that you're trying to do and how seriously you take it and you had said, you know, words are important. And I have a, I actually have a thing up in my office and it says, you know, words are heavy, heavy magic. I think I got it from somebody who actually used like to run it. Well, I think it comes from somebody who ran a cult somewhere. So <laughs> the story behind it, perhaps not so good, but words are heavy, heavy magic. <laughs> and anybody who is in the business of words, whether you're a leader, whether you're presenting, whether you're running a political campaign, you're a speech writer, or you're just somebody who's trying to elicit a change somewhere, you know, words are the only tool that you have. And so to treat them as heavy, heavy magic, to come at it with that much gravity, it's, it, it kind of means that if you're not feeling nervous, you're not feeling it enough. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. I want to go to the closing, to compelling people to act, because one of the thing that things that makes your work so incredible is that it always ended that way. It always ended with a fire in your belly, that feeling that not only do I want to do something about this, but that I can and I know how. How do you how do you write to create action? It's a good question. I mean, like I like I was saying before, it's it's one of, if not the most important things you can do with an audience. I mean, if you're not asking your audience for something, if you're not compelling them to act, then you know what's the point? What are you there for? Um, I usually, again, with with closings, it's my favorite part of the speech because you can actually finally have some fun. 
uh, once you've dispensed with the business. And, you know, you can, you can, you can tell a story, you can, you know, use history, which is what we do all the time, what President Obama likes to do all the time, um, to tie it directly to what people are going through right now, what people are feeling right now. And, you know, if we can make you cry or feel something uh, or get fired up, all the better. Um, it was my favorite part of any speech. And I think it actually, you know, helped us over the years and gave us a little leeway with writing those workmanlike sections in the middle of a speech that people who watch President Obama and reporters who cover him know that the good stuff's usually coming at the end. Um, so people will endure the workmanlike part of a speech to, to get to the payoff. Um, but it, even that said, one of my least favorite parts of the speech is the final paragraph. You know, once you've done this kind of great peroration and ending and, um, you know, you're writing the applause, then there's, there sort of has to come this sign off paragraph that I've always disliked where you just kind of wrap up what you're saying and say, all right, so let's go vote for this person or, you know, uh, support this bill or, or, you know, the end. And it's just, it's so, I can't think of a lot of speeches where I truly loved the last paragraph. And then, you know, you have to say the old, thank you, God bless you, God bless America. But, um, you know, there, you do have to signal to your audience that you're done so that they don't sit there in silence. You know, if people don't know that they should applaud you've kind of fallen flat on your face. So it does serve a purpose. What is that? What's a good ending line? Is it, I used to believe that it was a request, you know, to, you know, I invite you to, I dare you to, I, you know, I would like to equip you to, is that the best way to end? Is there a better way to end? I think that's a good way to do it. Um, you know, I, we just always in office, we always used, thank you. God bless you. God bless America. Mostly because, you don't use it then you get criticized for it which is a terrible reason to keep anything in a speech but it often saved us you know more energy uh than fighting with people over why he didn't say thank you god bless you god bless america um you know like even with the eulogy he gave for john lewis last month uh i i'll try to tie you know we'll sometimes take scripture or history and then pull a line out of it so um you know, we 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 talked about um, we'd taken a line from Dr. King about you know not walking alone, and I think the president closed with, "We're all so lucky to have had John walk with us for a while and show us the way." That would have been a great place to end, but then you have to say, "God bless you all, God bless America, uh, and this gentle soul who pulled it closer to its promise." But I, I'm I'm filibustering because I don't have a great answer to your question. I don't know if I've ever written a last line that I truly love. But in a way, that's great. And it's a bummer. <laughs> I guess. I guess. In, well, it, it, in a way, to have never written the last line, it's like never having written the perfect speech. You know, it's it's still something out there to to move towards or to, to aim towards. There's no such thing. I mean, I, I'd go back in time right now and look at any of his best speeches, and I'm sure I could find ways to make them better. Mm. And even if you write the perfect speech, you know, when you when you go to give the perfect speech that you have written, something will happen. There'll a word will be missed, uh, a section will be will be done in a way that wasn't perfect. You you know, you're right, there is no perfect way. There's perfect intentions, there's no perfect execution. And President Obama will edit up until the last minute. I mean, no matter how much time there is. He'll just he'll just keep going through drafts. You know, even even with last week's convention speech, I think he went through three drafts the day of and, and barely changed anything. But, you know, by the, the time the final draft came back, I think he changed two words. But he will just keep polishing it until it's time to go. And I had a little fun with it because, you know, somebody somebody working for the convention, I don't know who, I think was getting pretty annoyed that they didn't have his the text of his speech yet. And it was getting, you know, we were within about 30 minutes of showtime, an hour of showtime. And whoever it was leaked to reporters that President Obama was still editing his speech. And then CNN breathlessly reports President Obama still editing tonight's speech. And I just tweeted out, you know, this has been true since 2004. <laughs> I mean, he's he is always editing tonight's speech no matter what. Uh, you know, it was our, even our last State of the Union address. He added a new paragraph on his way to the Capitol. And that's not because um, he's unsure of what he wants to say or doesn't like it. It's he views a speech as th there's a reason he puts so much time and effort into it 
you know, from the beginning and through, you know, 3 a.m. the night before. And it's because a speech is just an argument. You're making an argument, but you're taking the time to make sure it's well thought out and well argued and well supported. And for the biggest speeches, you know, he would go through multiple drafts to make sure that it met those criteria down to the point where, you know, he's going through for precise word choice. And he would even say, this sentence needs one more syllable or one less syllable uh, to the point where it's almost like he's conducting a symphony. And that's what makes him so good at it. Uh, and then over, you know, over time, as we all got better at it, too, we would start to look for those things as well to the point where he didn't have to quite as much. But, you know, if if the speech was this week uh, and he had seven more days to edit it, he would have used that time to make sure that everything was exactly where he wanted it. You know, it's like people will criticize him for using a teleprompter. We use a teleprompter because the speech is exactly what he wants to say, down to the word, down to the syllable. So you put it in a teleprompter and make sure you read it the way you wanted it done. Uh, there's no shame in that. And it's actually better than just printing it out on paper and looking up and down constantly. My, my granddad used to head up a choir in his local church. And I always used to watch him as a young kid when my parents would, would take me in to, to watch the choir. And he'd have his eyes closed. He'd be conducting the choir with his eyes closed. And I used to look at him and I'd think, how, how do you do that with your eyes closed? And that's how a great speech feels to me. I don't know about for you or for anybody else, but you listen with your eyes closed and it's it's like a symphony. It's the up and the down, the arc, the story arcs, the the, the crescendos, the closure at the end. You know, it should feel a bit like a symphony where every syllable counts. That's exactly right. And I mean, that's something he taught me over time. And I think that's something you, you can only learn with time. I mean, one of the one of the more valuable lessons he taught me about it was, you know, it was, a, it was our it was the 2015 State of the Union address. And I'd been writing for him long enough that I should have known this. But a State of the Union address, you just kind of throw all the rules of speech writing out the window as you're putting it together. It's the worst speech of the year. It's It's the one that you the most work goes into it with the smallest payout. And every speechwriter kind of dreams of writing a State of the Union address for the President of the United States until you do, and then you never want to do it again. Um, because you've got an entire federal government, you know, desperate to get their ideas in this speech. So you, you have people lobbying you from every agency, and you, know, you get a list of 250 ideas, and you have to try to whittle that down to a manageable number, and then tie all these disparate ideas together. It's so difficult to make this whole thing stay together. Um, you know, it's, 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 I don't know the best analogy for it, but it's like, if you pull out, you know, one toothpick, the entire house of toothpicks comes down. Um, so you finally kind of get this whole thing together in, and it's long too. It's about 6,000, 7,000 words. And you've got it all together to the point where you feel like you can give the president a draft. So I'd, I'd give him a draft. And I thought this one was was all right. You know, for a State of the Union address, I thought it told a good story. I thought all the policy went together relatively seamlessly, even though you're talking about, you know, completely different policy areas throughout the speech. So I, I give it to him about eight days before the speech. And by the next afternoon, I still hadn't heard anything. So I'm starting to get a little nervous. Um, that we're running out of time if he hates it and I have to go back to the drawing board. And meanwhile, all the policy people are, you know, lighting my phone up saying, hey, is such and such in the speech? How can I help? What can I get you? Um, you know, random bottles of bourbon would show up on my desk from various agencies that desperately wanted their policies in the speech, which I didn't mind, but I, you know, I can't be bought, Julie. Um, <laughs> well, that's so a shame because I was, I was just about to try. <laughs> So finally, his assistant calls and says, hey, the president wants to see you. I'm like, great. I go upstairs. He's not sitting in the Oval Office. She says, oh, he's in his dining room. I'm like, well, this is this is different. So I go in and he's eating lunch. And he says, hey, sit down. And I'm like, oh, my God. And this is just not, it's not he didn't call me in here while he was eating lunch to tell me how great the speech was and that I'm an incredible asset to the team and send me on my way. I'm like, this sucks. I'm going to have to stay up all night long rewriting this. He goes, so this is really good this is the best shape we've been in a week out, I think ever. And I could probably deliver this as is. And I'm like, Oh, great. What am I doing here? I mean, first of all, whenever he says that it never actually means he wants to give it as is, especially if there's still seven days left to play with it. 
But he says, um, so the thing about it is, it's at a 10 the entire time. Every policy is in here. Uh, every paragraph matters. Every sentence matters. Every word matters. The entire thing is at a 10. And I need you to bring it down to a seven in places and a five in places and maybe even a three. You following me here? And I'm like, oh, I think so. And he goes, you listen to jazz. And I didn't, you know, I didn't want to lie to him, um, but not really. I don't. Or I didn't at least. And I was like, no. And he goes, you know, well, you know what they say about Miles Davis? And I say, well, obviously not. <laughs> and he says, it's the notes you don't play. It's the silences that really make his stuff powerful. And I'm like, okay, like, I think I can see that. And he says, I want you to go home tonight and I want you to pour yourself a drink and I want you to listen to Miles Davis. Don't do any work. Just listen to Miles Davis and you'll see what I'm talking about. And so I did. And it actually does make sense. And, you know, it was a lesson I knew from, from kind of more emotional, impactful speeches, but it hadn't crossed my mind for a state of the union. But you want to not just have pauses, but, but moments where you bring the audience down a little bit before you bring them back up. You want to play with them. You know, you want to conduct their own emotions, their feelings. Like I said before, let them know when to listen closely, when to lean forward almost, and when to go nuts and stand in applause. Uh, you want them to know which part is more important than the others. And, and you actually do that by every once in a while, it's okay to have a sentence that doesn't say much. Um, and to work in a pause. And, and you, you just want to carry that crowd so that, you know, they can go from a frenzy to absolute silence where you could hear a pen drop and then back to a standing ovation again. Uh, so I went back and, and worked at it. And he's been, you know, talking to me about jazz ever since. You just reminded me of, of one of the questions that I wanted to ask you because it ties quite nicely to that symphony piece. One of the things that I notice time and time and time again with incredible political speeches is, I'm going to call it the rule of three, which mm-hmm. is, you know, three kind of statements in a row. You know, it, I'm trying to think of a great example here, but maybe you can help me where it's three. Hang on, let me frame this question better. Am I making any sense before I go further? You're <laughs> You're making perfect sense. I, we've used it so many times. <laughs> oh, thank you. Because I'm wondering if it's if if it's a thing and it feels like something that I see over and over again. And I think it's so powerful, and I don't know why. Can you give me an example? Because I'm obviously not doing a great job of thinking of one in this moment. I came. I saw. I conquered. Okay. Let's. Yeah. I mean, the, I think the there must be some scientific explanation for it, but my you know understanding of it is just two ideas is too few. And it just seems like you haven't thought this through very well. And four is too many to remember. So three is just kind of the sweet spot. You know, today I want to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. So I remember President Obama wanted to give a big climate address in 2013 and to tie all of our different climate policies together. I mean, everything from making dishwashers run better to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and just tie all of it together under one banner. And this, so it was basically like a state of the union of the climate and clean energy. And so I have to think of a way, all right, there are about 90 different policy things we can touch on here. How do I tie them all together? And I went with a rule of three. Um, you know, and I, I put them all into three different buckets. One is, I mean, this is our, our strategy for, uh, to save the climate is to use more clean energy use less dirty energy and waste less energy overall. And if a policy wouldn't fit into each of those buckets, so, you know, clean energy is like solar and wind and less dirty energy is moving away from coal and wasting less energy is, you know, appliance standards and fuel efficient cars and whatnot. And if a policy didn't fit in those three buckets, I didn't put it in the speech. So I made sure to remind the audience several times in the speech where we are, right? So, you know, if we're going to, we're going to save the planet, we got to generate more clean energy. All right, so that was how that we're going to generate more clean energy. Now I want to talk about using less dirty energy. All right, so that was how we use less dirty energy. Now I want to talk about wasting less energy overall. And, you know, people might not remember everything, but, but three is a heck of a lot easier than four. And two ideas just doesn't seem like you've put enough thought into it. Just in, in closing up, in closing up, you said that you don't you don't miss the White House, which I can from the hours and the, the pressure I can understand. Do you miss 
the access, and I don't mean the access to to power or or to the human beings. Do you miss the access to getting your words out there to the largest possible audience with the largest possible stakes? Um, yeah, sure. I, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to still be working with President Obama, so I can do that from time to time. But, you know, they're his. Um, yeah, I mean, I what what I mean, but when I say I don't miss the White House is, it's it, it's a wonderful place to go to work. I miss the people um, who work there. You know, the the resident staff that's been around for decades. I certainly miss being able to work on complicated problems. You know, like if 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 we were in there during COVID, you know, we would have red teamed this virus into oblivion, you know, within the first month. Um, I don't miss the hours. <laughs> and, and I, and I do think by the end of it, um, I was kind of feeling burned out. I mean, I, I wouldn't have stayed even if, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton had won. It was, it was time to go and it was time for some new ideas to come in there. And, you know, hopefully someday some of these students I'm training to replace me will be in there. Um, but yeah, you always miss the excitement and, and you, you miss the opportunity to make a difference on a big scale. You know, I just have to find a new way to do that. And, and for me, it's it's teaching and, you know, joining a company where I can train up um, a whole new generation of young speechwriters, you know, to like, I guess part of part of being human is, is we ultimately replace ourselves. Uh, you know, that's I my wife's having our, our first kid in November and, you know, that this human being is going to replace us on this planet someday. But so if I can also train up a couple dozen students a year to replace me, um, people who care about good government and good policy and making a difference and caring about people, um, then that's, that's probably the biggest impact I can have going forward. My final question in the last lecture that you did, and for anybody who's listening, We'll try and put a link to the last lecture in the show notes. I've sent it around to I don't know how many how many people in my network. You gave the last lecture to the graduating class of 2020 and you, you had to do it virtually. And you were talking about changing the world, that now might not be the best time to graduate, but now is probably one of the best times to change the world. And you, you said this piece, which I just, my heart just kind of went, that's so true. You said, you will get tired you will get disappointed. It's messy, it's complicated, and it will break your heart. Any, as your final piece of advice or wisdom out there for people who are currently in the process of leading or campaigning or writing, trying to do just that, and who are feeling that way in this moment, what's the, what's one thing that it would be great for them to remember? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, out of all 2,922 days in the White House uh, and all the days it took to get there, there were only a few where you felt true victory, like all-encompassing victory. Um, you know, the, the day we passed health reform, uh, the day, you know, we got bin Laden, the, the day we got the Paris Agreement. Um, and, and, you know, there were many more, but most days you're just trying to move the ball forward um, to get to those moments. I mean, each of those took years and years and years of effort. And, you know, if, there are a lot of days where I'd, I'd leave the White House worried we didn't accomplish anything that day and we didn't move the ball forward. Uh, and that's tough. And, you know, there's a media environment that doesn't reward you for trying. It only cares about, you know, the big victories. And it can get discouraging, but on days where you move forward just a little bit, you know, you have to take that as a win and, and find things that remind you of that. And for, you know, for us, it was, you know, President Obama asked um, his staff to set up to make sure he got 10 letters a night uh, of the, I think, 7,000 or so he got every day. Um, and he, he made sure, you know, give me a representative sample. I, I, you know, I, I, even if they hate me, I just want to know what people are saying. And we'd read those too. And every once in a while, you know, you read one about somebody whose life had been changed, whether it was, you know, they can finally afford their medicine or their pre-existing condition was covered, or, you know, they can serve in the military now without having to lie about um, being gay, whatever it is, you know, you read that and you're like, Shh, man, that's exactly what it's all about. So it is going to be like that. I mean, certainly public service is messy and frustrating. That's, you know, how democracy was designed. Um, you know, dictatorships can 
get things done with a snap, but it's not a great way to live. Um, but if you can find those proof points that you are making a difference bit by bit and, you know, share them with your team, you know, share them with your boss, share them with your employees, you know, that's how you keep people fired up and moving forward. And that, that's a tough thing to do too. If, if you're, you know, if you're kind of in the, uh, in the barrel, as we used to say, if we were having a tough stretch to, you know, remind you to buck each other up when you're feeling pretty low, uh, always make sure you're a person that does that, whether it's, you know, for your teammates or for your employees, you know, find a way to convince people that what you're doing matters and it's important. And if you stick with it, you're going to have a big impact. And, you know, as despairing as many people might feel about the structures that we, that we are in at the moment, be it, you know, lockdown or be it political structures, economic structures, regardless, just the very fact there that people believe that they can write a letter to their government, write a letter to to the person who is, you know, running the nation, and that letter will be read, and that that person's team will read those letters. I think that that in and of itself is a reason to be hopeful and grateful. Absolutely. You know, it, I've read letters where you could tell the person was crying as they wrote it because there's a couple ink smears. But the very fact that they, even if they were angry, the very fact that they thought somebody was going to read this and care is in its, of itself an act of hope. Uh, and so I, I wanted to convince my students, you know, especially now, I, this was this, the, the, the last lecture you're talking about, you know, it was supposed to be delivered. It was supposed to be joyous. It was supposed to be delivered in a crowded bar across from Wrigley Field, the greatest baseball stadium in the world. Um, where all the students are hanging out and having a beer and, and just having a lot of fun. And instead, you know, right when their lives are supposed to be opening up into this just giant arc of possibility, you know, everybody's trapped at home and they can't see each other. Uh, and there are no jobs to be had. And so I just, I wanted to remind them, um, to, especially for, for people that want to change the world, that it, it takes a long, long time and you may never even see it happen, but, if you can do something that leaves it just a little bit better, you know, that, that leaves the person coming up behind you with a, with a stronger foothold. I mean, that's really all we're asked to do. Um, and there's a lot of joy to be found in that too. Just the showing up. The yeah. power is in the showing up. Well, Cody, thank you so much for, for your thank time. You. It's been an absolute honor to have you on. I enjoyed it very much. Thanks so much for listening. We really hope you enjoyed this episode and found tons and tons of useful ideas and insights for growing your own influence. Now, for those of you who want to take the next step in your influence journey, if you want to take everything you have learned today and just ramp it up a notch, or you just want to learn more about the power of thought leadership when it comes to growing a business, an enterprise, or spreading an idea, there is now also a research paper that you can download from my website, juliemasters.com pop in your email address it is free we will not spam you but it is jam-packed full of all the ideas tools and case studies that I have come across in 10 years of doing this work it's called the influencer code it's not long but it is full of value so download it keep it share it juice it for all it is worth I hope that it makes a massive difference in your career or business Thank you always to our producer, co-founder, and the main brain, I'm not joking, behind the Inside Influence podcast, Lauren Kelly. In the words of Jerry Maguire, you complete me. And if you did enjoy the show, then we would love you to share this podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, whatever your platform of choice happens to be. And don't forget to subscribe.